Um, I've argued that there is what we can call a breakaway civilization that probably uses very advanced technology in some areas. I don't know how many areas. And uh, in all likelihood that there's a program that takes us off this planet and goes beyond. How far beyond, I don't know. Um, it's interesting, and I'm sure everyone in this room is aware that uh, I might have a different perspective on this than my colleagues on the tape, on the um, panel here. And um, it's not that I think that everyone else is wrong, and I'm right. I certainly am sure that I'm wrong about a lot of things. Um, but what I would suggest is that we're only best moving forward when we deal with, uh, as a community, with evidence that we can call um, verifiable, and uh, that when we take it to the rest of the world, we can defend. So that's a concept we can call falsifiability, which means that uh, it doesn't mean something's false. It means that you can test it to see whether it's true or false. And um, it's been my contention that uh, some of the information presented at this conference um, is not falsifiable and uh, therefore really cannot qualify as actual evidence. Might be true, might not be true, but if I can't test it, if I can't have any opportunity ever to test it, then uh, it really needs to be set aside and we can put it in the gray box. Evidence just doesn't include documents. It also includes testimony. Both testimony as to what witnesses saw and did and documents where chain of custody have been proven are valid forms of evidence. And even though a lot of testimony is admissible in a court of law, some people find that the scientific method works better for them. And I think that people like us that have information that we don't have a whole lot of cooperation or documentation behind, we need to understand also that there are different personality types out there, different ways of approaching problems, left brain, right brain individuals. And each of us are, are going to look for different types of information to validate either our experiences or what we think is reality. So I think that each of these different personality types and left and brain, right brain type people need to, need to realize that and also realize that people that call themselves experiencers um, are heavily invested in getting to the truth, whatever that is as well. Uh, wait a minute, okay? <laughs> um, I'm now an engineering section chief on the Apollo program, uh, and actually we had the S-4B contract, which is the engineering it's the command center of all the apollo missions and uh actually nasa was involved we had the uh, paper paper clip people come in but you guys don't understand douglas did all of this work four five six seven years before nasa even existed and so we have massive documents about going out into space, not just going to the moon. That was the first phase of an enormous program that Douglas had come up with with the, C the fellows in the secret think tank. So let me just say, uh, how did my secretary get involved, okay? I don't want to make it complicated. I don't want to try to sidestep it. Uh, could could we, word, uh, wait excuse, a minute. Excuse me, just, excuse me just a moment. If we could, uh, uh, if we could focus on the, the secret space program and uh, w we'll just have to book you for a whole weekend because you have stories that we want, you know, that are great. Okay. But if we could just focus on how you view the evidence of the government's uh, All right. and I'm, the non-governmental evidence I'm for the secret space there. program. I appreciate that. To get I know. There. Okay. <laughs> and you're precious. Back to my secretary. Okay. No, no kidding. Wait a minute. We have in Douglas uh, meetings every single day on the Apollo program, and when we're we're working together, trying to come up with an answer of a major problem on the Apollo program. Uh, my secretary puts it in my head and says, Bill, tell them certain, certain information. This was always the correct information. 
Now, I, can't, I cannot say that this didn't happen. What I can say about the Mars Jump Room program is that I stand by the seven whistleblowers who have thus far come forward and described going to Mars via Jump Room. And those individuals, in my opinion, are Michael C. Ralph, Arthur Neumann, who was the Henry Deacon informant to Project Camelot, myself, my fellow jumper, William Brett Stillings, my dear friend, Laura Eisenhower, who brought some very interesting testimonial evidence, which I'll describe in, in closing, um, and then Bernard Mendez and William White Crow, who was known as William Paris back when he was my martial arts instructor on Pegasus, and then I ran into him when he was serving as a U.S. Army guard on Mars in the 1982-83 time frame. Let's, let me just close with three very conspicuous points about this testimonial evidence. And, the, and, and I'll use it as an example to show how testimonial evidence can, can lead to ineluctable conclusions just based on logic. Let me share one that involves Laura Eisenhower. When Laura came forward and stated that she was uh, subjected to a recruitment campaign to go to Mars with her then two-year, her then two ten-year-old twin boys, Gavin and Garrick Eisenhower, who are certainly astronaut material, um, she stated to, in an interview to Alfred Lambermont Weber that she was told she was going to be going to Mars via ARC. And in her discussion of that, she thought, well, they're analogizing to Noah's ARC, and they're calling these space planes that are going to take us to Mars ARCs, A-R-K. In fact, I know because of my training and my project experiences in the CIA's Mars Jump Room program, right, that, that, the, uh, that the jump rooms, the technical term for the jump rooms was ARC, aeronautical repositioning chamber. And just in closing, let me provide another lead that the testimonial evidence has led to, and that is William White Crow and I have provided not just very controversial evidence of taking a jump room to Mars many times, but the fact that in the 1982-83 time frame at the building in El Segundo, California, where the West Coast jump room was, we encountered a very famous American who was supposed to be dead already, and that was Howard Hughes. And recently, we, we've been doing interviews with Major General Mark Music and Douglas Wellman regarding their book, Boxes, The Secret Life of Howard Hughes, in which, to my satisfaction, they proved that Howard Hughes' death was faked in April of 1976 so that he could work on sensitive technical projects connected to the CIA, like the Glomar Explorer and the Mars Jump Room program, without the risk of assassination or abduction. We're only best moving forward when we deal with as a community with evidence that we can call um, verifiable. There's definitely been a lot of research in these programs into the soul and transferring the soul, um, verifying the existence of a soul. So what the interesting part is that the Nazis, they originally began to, I guess, marry some of these uh, esoteric kind of principles, I guess we would call with science, and they started developing what were, were some very interesting scientific theories and, and, and uh, ideas about how to create technology. Um, so I, on Friday, I did a, Friday night, I did the presentation on the Navy Secret Space Program. Um, tomorrow I'm doing a workshop on Antarctica and uh, the Secret Space Program down there, and basically tracing how uh, the, the German breakaway group established uh, their presence in Antarctica using the uh, German companies that were the ones fulfilling the tenders for the different flying saucer prototypes. So tracing the involvement of companies like uh, Forker Wolf and uh, the Siemens Corporation, Messerschmitt, um, and, and, and how these uh, German companies worked with American companies both prior to the Second World War, during the Second World War, and after the Second World War in Antarctica, and, and how that evolved into what is uh, what Corey describes as the interplanetary corporate conglomerate, which has its headquarters or had its headquarters in Antarctica. And I'll be also relating that to the... Um, uh, the discoveries of uh, these uh, ancient alien artifacts in Antarctica and uh, why the, um, the the secret space program down there in Antarctica is, is re really putting a lot of effort into uh, researching and finding out how these uh, artifacts might help them uh, further develop their programs. Yes, this is real. On top of that, you've got the entire history of testimony of UFO crash retrievals, 
testimony dealing with uh, attempts to replicate the technology through the so-called ARV, alien reproduction vehicle, which uh, I credit that story, I think is a true story. Um, so we've got the motivation, that is anomalies in space, to investigate. We've got the um, means to study, that is retrieval of exotic technology, UFOs. And there's enough good evidence that we've been working on replicating them. And then you've got stories from NASA uh, talking about uh, encountering uh, bases and beings out in space. So to me, that's more than ample motivation for a highly secret space program. On top of that, you've got billions, maybe trillions of dollars of missing money through the financial black hole at the center of our global financial system. Uh, it's reasonable to ask where is some of that money going.